presenters um, from our Portland, Maine office is Jeff Summer, and Jeff is our managing director. He previously was the leader of two uh, service lines, affiliations and partnerships, as well as capital planning and access. For 25 years, he has focused on assisting clients with strategic initiatives, including planning and executing major capital projects, analyzing strategic options, crafting innovative affiliations, and executing business development opportunities. Opal Greenway is in our Nashville office. She is an accomplished healthcare and finance professional who focuses primarily on the strategic needs of healthcare service providers. She's an expert in valuation, mergers and acquisitions, strategy, physician compensation, and regulatory compliance. With that, we will turn it over to our first speaker today, and that is Jeff. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Uh, and thank you, um, folks who have joined us today for taking time out of your schedules. Um, we appreciate you taking the time and hope that uh, today's webinar is informative. Um, let's get at the, the agenda here. Um, we're going to spend just a few minutes on some national trends uh, to set the stage also want to provide some context around what we view as the operational toolbox available to health system and hospital leadership. Um, and today's webinar is then going to focus on uh, practice operations improvement. Opal will walk you through that. Uh, and then we will find um, um, some opportunity to talk about uh, staffing efficiencies and uh, a, a tool that we call demand-based staffing that we've, we've developed for our clients. And then lastly, we should have some time for some questions uh, and, and discussion. Um, thinking about industry trends, um, there are significant headwinds um, that are buffeting the industry. Um, and you can see here a, a number of factors uh, indicated. There's three that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. And one of those is high deductible health plans. You'll see a reference later uh, in the deck to an outlook from a rating agency describing uh, the growth in bad debt. What we're seeing is even in states with had the expansion of Medicaid, great reduction in bad debt uh, as a result of expansion, but then a slow increase or a not so slow increase in bad debt percentages um, as high deductible, high deductible health plans become more prevalent and folks have these $5,000, $10,000 deductibles that do uh, generate a fair amount of bad debt. That's a, uh, a real challenge. Um, also, the, it puts increasing focus on value and consumerism, which you can see on the lower right-hand uh, box. Consumerism really is one of those factors that hospitals and health systems need to uh, really take to mind. Uh, retail service mindset, folks want convenience. They also want transparent pricing and increasingly are, are comfortable with the idea of shopping for price. That's especially true if folks have significant first dollar exposure to uh, the cost of a service, uh, as is increasingly the case with high deductible health plans. The, the middle bottom box is one that I would emphasize as well. A lot of disruptors out there that are looking at doing, um, providing service more efficiently, more conveniently at a lower cost. We see this with the billions of dollars flowing into urgent care. We see this with the Aetna CVS tie-up, Walmart, Humana, and the Haven Initiative that Amazon, um, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan have launched. All of these have the potential to develop new business models that are disruptive to um, hospitals and health systems that have been incumbents in the markets. This is all going on in an environment where the largest payer for most uh, of our organizations, Medicare, the margins have been eroding. This is the MedPAC report that's generated to Congress every year. Uh, it's the most recent one. They do provide a modest projection going forward. And you can see there's clearly been a significant downward movement in these margins since 2013. And this continues to pose challenges for hospitals and health systems and providers of all types. Moody's Investor Service, uh, reiterating bad news that I think most of us are familiar with, operating cash flows will, will continue to be a challenge, bad debt being one of the reasons for that. Um, the other uh, driver has been that the expense structure uh, and expense uh, inflators um, have, uh, have a built-in uh, rate of increase to them that has been outpacing revenues in many 
uh, instances. And so that has has contracted uh, market, uh, excuse me, margins. Um, and so bad debt, you can see here, is projected to grow by eight or nine percent. And that really is um, being driven. You see the benefits of the expansion of Medicaid in many states or the private exchanges um, that were part of the ACA being eroded by various changes uh, that have occurred, um, but also really that, that high deductible health plan and, and significant exposure to costs driving bad debt going forward. The end result of this, these sets of challenges are hospital closures. Uh, and this map depicts those closures. You can see um, um, that there is certainly a clustering in some states, and that clustering is disproportionately, although not exclusively, in states that did not expand, expand Medicaid. Um, the other point I would note is obviously there's been a, a significant uh, a compounding of bankruptcies as well that can severely uh, disrupt or limit hospital operations and, and the, the scope and breadth of the mission of a, a local health system that has to then curtail uh, its offerings to emerge from bankruptcy if they're, they're able to do so. Um, the consequences of getting this wrong uh, I think all of us who are in healthcare and helping to deliver services or work with the folks who are delivering services in communities, often in rural communities, we intuitively understand that there is a consequence if a hospital closes. Some researchers in California have provided the, the uh, uh, statistical proof of this and uh, studied hospital closures in California and looked at um, uh, mortality rates for service areas that had closures versus their, those that had not. Now, this was, was very much true in rural uh, markets, um, but you can see the consequence of closures. And so it's something we should keep in mind as we think about uh, these issues. Proactive steps are the most important thing that a leadership team can do to avoid the worst case outcome. Uh, and so we certainly would encourage our clients and uh, participants in this webinar to be proactive in how they uh, address challenges. That's the point of uh, this webinar is to give you some tools to be able to do that. One of the things we thought might be helpful um, was to understand for folks that are on this webinar, um, how many of you would describe yourself as healthy organizations? And we provided uh, brief descriptions here of these. Uh, you have adequate cash flow to fund needed investments and initiatives healthy top line revenue growth, good expense management, positive operating margin, and a strong and stable market position. So that's a healthy organization across those, those various variables. One that has some compromising qualities would be one that, that perhaps is struggling to manage margin, struggling to keep expenses in line with top line revenue. Uh, perhaps you've dipped into negative operating margin territory uh, and that is, is, has some risk of, of overwhelming either tax proceeds or returns on your, your reserves. Um, and there may be some emerging signs of weakness in the market and your market position, some eroding market share or eroding payer mix as uh, commercial payers may, may be getting peeled off by, by other competitors. That's a compromised organization. One that's stressed, two years um, of material deferred investment two years or more of uh, flat top line revenue growth under 3%, negative total margin, and a market position that is clearly beginning to erode. That would be a stressed organization. One that is distressed, um, three or more years of deferred investment, three or more years of top line revenue growth less than 2%, so really flat uh, revenue growth, negative cash flow. So not just negative uh, total margin, but negative cash flow. Reserves are being depleted, the market position is material eroded and trajectory cannot be sustained. Um, that's how we think in really broad brush strokes. Um, and I realize there's a lot of nuance that, that is not addressed above or on this slide. But as you think about those categories, what Kimberly is gonna do is ask you to describe or select the one that best describes your organization. Kimberly, do you wanna do that? Sure, Jeff, thank you. Um, in your window, you should see an interactive poll right now. Um, and please wake up your fingers from coffee and lunch and let us know if you believe that your organization is healthy, compromised, stressed, or distressed. And we'll give people a few seconds to respond and then we will share the results with everyone on the screen.
And thank you, uh, uh, Kimberly. We're, we're curious to see the breakout of folks. Um, and obviously, uh, we re recognize these categories are not perfect. You may belong to one uh, or several of the categories. But pick the one that most, most describes you. Uh, so interesting breakout. The good news is a few distressed organizations. Um, that's good. You certainly want to be thinking about your operational tool toolbox and performance improvement before you're distressed. Um, and um, certainly it's always good to be aware of these items, even if you're in the healthy category. So that compromised and stressed group, uh, you know, our, our advice would be uh, don't um, uh, wait too long. Proactive action is, is really um, critically important. Obviously, as you get towards the distressed category, the, the level of urgency increases. Uh, and frankly, the level of magnitude of course correction also increases. And that's one of the reasons why you want to be proactive. Thank you for filling that out. Um, very helpful to, to have that context as we go through the, the webinar. Um, we still have the results up on screen. Can we take those down by any chance? There we go. Thank you, uh, Kimberly, um, very much. Um, what we wanted to do was spend a little bit of time before we dive into the clinic operations performance um, um, part of the discussion and the staffing efficiency is just think broadly about strategic risk and the operating environment and um, what are some of the tools that are available to mitigate those risks. We think about risk coming in four vectors. There's operating risk, uh, there's value risk, which is a newer factor really around some of the advanced payment models and um, global budgets and um, ACO related activity. Um, it's the interface between um, price or cost and quality. So a lot of uh, issues there. Uh, on the operating side, um, certainly this gets to how efficient your organization is. And you can see uh, today we're talking about uh, demand-based staffing and provider practice operations. Um, some colleagues of ours did a webinar last or earlier this month, I believe, uh, specifically on revenue cycle encoding and practice and clinic designations. So we intend to try to address uh, many of these, these operating tools and performance improvement tools over the coming months so that you have uh, some insights into these. Um, we'll focus on, again, demand-based staffing, um, but first um, the provider practice operations uh, tool set uh, going forward. Uh, with that, what I'd like to do is turn the, the conversation over to Opal, who will walk you through um, the practice operations and opportunity. Thank you, Jeff. Let's make sure I have control here. There we go. So with that, one of the things that in most healthcare organizations are very familiar with is the losses in the physician clinics that are owned by hospitals and healthcare entities. There's a, increasingly a large subsidy that's being paid to cover these practice losses. These losses are calculated before any accounting for downstream revenue. And on average, across all different specialties, is just under $200,000 per FTE physician. Um, again, that is across all different specialties. Certain specialties have higher, others have lower. And one of the reasons for that loss that's created is that fact that practices are acquired by hospitals and health systems oftentimes without, based off of a, a need rather than thinking that the practice might go to a competitor, it might go out of business, the physician is nearing retirement and wants to be employed for a variety of reasons rather than on a set strategy for acquiring those practices or developing new clinics. Uh, several things that contribute to these practices practice losses that happen both before and after acquisition, these that are highlighted in gray here, are things that for the most part we don't have as much control over. They're just the nature of these acquisitions, but you know we can do better on the front end. Those that are la colored in blue are things that we, after we already have the practices underneath our hospital umbrella, we need to be thinking about focusing on. Now, one thing I will point out is the fact that there's an average loss of under $200,000 per FTE physician. Many healthcare entities have recognized that that's a given. We've accepted it. This is, this is the no, new norm and that's fine. The problem with that mentality is it creates a financial environment that's not sustainable. 
slowly over the years if we do not address how we are actually operating these practices, that loss per physician is going to be increasing. And we don't know for a fact that the downstream revenue that we experience on the hospital side will continue to always be able to create the margin to cover those losses. So we're gonna spend time focusing today on ones that have the biggest bang for your buck as far as investing the time to really address these issues to be able to have an impact on those losses that you're experiencing in the practice. So the number one thing that is going to be an expense on the physician practice side is going to be your physician spend. So with that, we have a polling question regarding your physician contracts and your understanding and where you are currently with that physician spend. So. Kimberly, if you'll go ahead with the question. All right, thank you, Opal. Um, now on your screen, um, you will see a poll question regarding your physician contract. Which of the following have you applied? And we can select as many as are pertinent here. Standard contracts among all employed physicians, incentive compensation for all physicians employed longer than two years, standard incentive compensation within specialties, or fair market valuation report uh, supporting comp paid for each physician. And we see the results coming in and give people a little bit more time. It looks like 70% are saying standard contracts among all employed physicians right now. That's heavily in the lead. And with that, I will close out this poll and share the There we, there we go. Okay, so what I'm seeing here, right, is that we, you know, most groups have moved to some sort of standardized contract. Hopefully that means you have a contract template with an addendum that you are adjusting based off the specific needs of that physician. Um, and only 35% are actually have all their physicians um, being generating compensation through incentive payments, whether that be productivity or quality payments. So with only 35% um, doing that, we can talk a little bit about why in moving towards incentive compensation, not just productivity, but the quality is a critical component of making sure that you're moving that physician spend in alignment with your overall strategy. One thing I will say a word of advice at this point is when it comes to compensation for physicians and otherwise, we do not uh, recommend paying money that we're not getting for things we are not getting a return on. So when we think about how we want to set up any contract, whether it is a uh, professional services agreement or if it is a compensation agreement, we want to incentivize things that generate a return for the hospital. For those of us that are very much stuck still in a fee-for-service model with our payers, we want to make sure we're incentivizing productivity. For those of us who are further along the value curve and are and are planning for that in the future, we want to make sure we're incentivizing quality payments and things that impact. So those anybody who's within an ACO, making sure your compensation is overall in line with that ACO. And of course, within that, as we saw some uh, fewer people talked about having standardized incentive compensation within their different specialties, and also making sure that the compensation you're paying is compliant with Stark and anti-kickback regulations. So a lot of the hospitals that we have worked with, I'm happy to see on the poll that this is fewer the case than for the people who are on this webinar, but a lot of physicians have one-off contracts that are negotiated. And maybe you have a standardized contract for, that you have a template for all of your employed physicians, but we can talk to Joe Physician who's in cardiology about a specific, you know, tweak his contract specifically for him. Or, you know, Susie over in um, neurology, we've tweaked her contract specifically for her. And we start moving further and further away from having a compensation actual plan for our physicians that's governed by an entity with regards to the board and paid attention to. And contracts, even if it's in writing and standardized, there's tweaks here and there. And sometimes they're documented, sometimes they're not. One of the big things that happens that we've seen is people will think if I have a fair market valuation report, I'm covered. Therefore, whatever, whatever I pay based off of that report, I will be fine. Unfortunately, what we have seen is one, depending on the quality of the valuation report, but also how does the actual operations of that report 
within the contract, within your payroll actually tie together and is it in a seamless manner that is can make sure that everything is consistently executed. So if you have a change in the contract, is that something that's still reported by fair market value? Is that something that gets translated over to payroll? And, um, we had the unfortunate incident of working with the uh, hospital in the Midwest that they thought they were doing everything correctly. They had a fair market valuation report. It had a cap on the compensation for the this, uh, physician. This was a cardiologist. And, you know, they made sure that the contract was in there. They had a contract with the physician. People reviewed it. And unfortunately, they took a per work RVU amount out of the valuation report, but did not put in the cap language. And as a consequence, we had a highly productive physician who was just going well above the 90th percentile on their productivity. We performed an audit. It was all very legitimate. We didn't have any coding issues or billing issues, but the consequence was they contractually owed the physician over $600,000 more than what was allowed in the fair market value report. This is a way of saying, OIG, come please knock at my door and come and do an audit and inspect us when you have compensation that that's that far outside of fair market value. The result, of course, because they did illegally owe the physician that money, they had to go through a self-reporting policy. They had to renegotiate the contract with the physician. And in the end, they actually had to ask the physician to pay back some of that money. You can imagine the damage that did to the relationship. And it took us about six months to actually renegotiate and get things back to a peaceful state when you have that. But this is a hospital that thought they were doing everything right, but not making sure things were done consistently. So I want to say just because you have a standardized contract, just because you have the fair market valuation report, if you're not continuously monitoring that and making sure that all your checks and balances are in place, you can still get yourself into trouble and it greatly increase your physician spend. That being said, another aspect that goes from both the contract and the practice management aspect is making sure that the terms of the contract are actually operationalized within the clinic itself. One of the things that we often see in contracts is that a physician will provide reasonable and customary full-time hours of face-to-face -face patient engagement time, rather than defining a required amount of time for that physician. For a lot of specialties across the average, that's usually about 36 to 40 hours a week. Different specialties do have their different averages, depending on how many days they're in the clinic versus surgeons who may be in the, um, in the OR at certain times. So here's an example of another group that we've worked with in New England where the contract said reasonable full-time hours initially. They actually worked hard to change their contracts to say that each physician would spend a minimum of 32 hours per week with face-to-face -face time for, the, for this specific specialty. And I believe that the one that's up here on that you're seeing is um, internal medicine group. And when we went and pulled the actual scheduling templates and examined how the schedules had been executed over the past six months, and this was an organization that had a patient access issue where patients had a long wait time to be able to get in for getting a new appointment, we looked at the schedules and we had saw that physicians, even though their contract stated that they were going to be spending a minimum of 32 hours in the clinic face-to-face -face with patients, not doing administrative work, but actual patient time, we're doing 25, 26, 29 hours, and realizing that when we had a patient access issue and there's patients knocking down the door trying to you know, be able to get appointments because of access issues, that this was costing us a significant amount of money. If we just bumped it up to 32 that was required in their contract, that would realize a net benefit of $217,000 versus if we actually got them up to 40 hours per week, which some of them were very willing to do, but we just had to operationalize it, that could have been over $600,000 of benefit to this, uh, this specific group that was employed by a hospital. So when we think about that, and this is still assuming the number of weeks per year that they were typically working. So not increasing that at all. So making sure that those are operationalized. Now, when you focus on shifting from physician spend, the other area of big expense is going to be on your labor. And Jeff will talk a little bit more about labor and productivity in a moment, but within the physician clinic itself, we want to make sure our labor spend is actually working efficiently. And one of the ways that we do that is with actual standardized workflow and paying attention to the schedules and having policies and protocols in place 
that dictate how the patient is going to be able to move throughout the clinic to maximize efficiencies. Working with each of the individual clinics, you can come up with what is the appropriate patient flow from sign-in to rooming to scheduling the next visit and making sure you have all the different pieces in place and making it as simple for anyone as possible. Checklists are a great way of doing this, especially when, when you design the checklist, you can actually tie them back to some sort of metric, whether it's a quality metric, if you're doing population health, or if you have a patient access issue with a throughput uh, metric to be able to measuring. The other reason why this is absolutely critical is a lot of the organizations we work with have an issue of having a shortage of actual quality staff that they can rely on. And so they oftentimes might be short staffed. When they are short staffed, then they oftentimes might be able to employ something that we call a float pool. Uh, this is where if somebody calls in, you do have a group of FTEs that change from location to location based off of needs. But to be able to move from location to location, a certain level of standardization is required in order for somebody to be able to slot into in the different roles within that clinic and making sure that there's cross training amongst people so that they can fit where they need to when we have to readjust based off of demand for those places that have multiple locations or have outreach clinics. Not being able to do that creates confusion and loss efficiencies. And a lot of the places we go to, people will say, I would rather almost not have the body than have a, an, having somebody fill in this position that doesn't know what they're doing because I end up doing double the amount of work by trying to actually train somebody at the same time. And this is somebody who was not needing actual training from the position. It's just this office operated differently than another in a enough of a variance that was cool creating losses and efficiencies. Another thing I want to emphasize is that when it comes to having workflows, policies, and procedures, people will do what is inspected rather than what is expected. So just passing policies but not enforcing them is not going to have any impact. It helps to have, and on a regular basis, especially once you've trained a new protocol within your practice, it goes great for two weeks. You come back uh, a month and a half in, and they're back to doing exactly what they were doing beforehand. So unless you have that constant reinforcement, then these policies and protocols are not going to stick, and then what's the point of having them? I will say once, um, this right here is a list of the different policies that with regards to just patient flow are absolutely critical to have in a practice, that, pay, that anybody who's working the front desk knows how to be able to create an appointment, delete an appointment. What do we do with cancellation? What is our no-show policies? What letters need to go out to the patients to be able to reschedule that? Do we have a waiting list and how do we work the waiting list? I've seen everything from a very well-developed waiting list in a computerized system versus a sticky post-it notes all over you know, the front desk, which some of you might have witnessed in your practices. What do we do we have, if we have a patient access issue, how are we monitoring the wait time? How are we doing follow-up appointments and same day appointments and our scheduling templates to make sure we can accommodate those to be able to have our uh, patient access? This is something that should be done in coordination with both the practice manager or practice administrator, the physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant working in that clinic, as well as the members of the team that are working in that clinic. Because setting down any sort of policy from the top down without the physician input is going to cause problems of not being able to address how that physician practices medicine. Moving on, another part of it is, I, I know that John, my colleague John Bain spoke a little bit of this on the hospital side at our previous presentation, so I'm going to focus here on revenue cycle issues in the clinic itself. There's some critical components at the macro level that needs to make sure that you're having to make sure you're getting paid for the work that you do and also to make sure your fees and prices as we're increasing price transparency are absolutely critical of, you know, what are your target charges? Are they set within reason within the Medicare fee schedule? Um, what are your, are you reviewing your contracts on a regular basis? I will say we had an instance with a practice that had not renegotiated their contracts in over five years. They focus on renegotiating the hospital contracts, but hadn't paid attention to the physician practice contracts in over five years, which was highly problematic because they didn't even know if they were executing the contracts appropriately and changing their um, the fee schedules based off of those contracts. One of the aspects that we've seen when it comes to actual practice management is 
when we see the revenue cycle, when you buy up a bunch of practices, it gets overly centralized. Everything gets brought in house to all together in a room, maybe at the hospital, rather than anybody associated with billing or coding in the physician clinics themselves. The consequence of that is you're not able to give timely feedback to the physicians when there's an opportunity for coding and documentation issues. Physicians getting what are called deficiency reports on a regular basis to be able to address issues that are causing us to not be able to bill in a timely manner, causing us to not be able to bill at the appropriate level, or not being able to drop, drop a claim. So it's critical for the physician to get that feedback as soon as possible. My top, some of my top practices have it set up where they're getting feedback the same day. As soon as it's recognized, the physician gets the feedback. I've also gone into practices where we're talking about something in November that happened in January, and I step in and say, wait, why are we talking about this? It's not going to change anything if you're talking about issues back in January. You have to be getting those deficiency reports to the physicians to address and identifying education opportunities at least once a week. Um, some I know that, you know, it was a big push to get to monthly, but ideally, getting it, if you can't have a live daily deficiency report getting to them, then at least once a week. Other aspects that we see operationalized in the practice are what happens at the front desk. Are they doing insurance eligibility verification? And that is not, hey, has any of your information changed? It is walking through all aspects for that insurance eligibility step by step and actually, you know, verifying name. Tell the, ask them, don't ask them, do they have the same address? Say, is your address still, you know, 1000 Pennsylvania Avenue? You know, whatever it is, making sure you're going it through it step by step and a checklist every single time, no matter who the patient is, even if you recognize the patient, you need to go through these different steps to make it second nature for the people at the front desk. Uh, a lot of places we go into that prior authorization process is overly complex. You have uh, one person doing it with no backstops whatsoever, and if that person wears multiple hats and they're used to spending an entire day on the phone on hold for it with payers, if they have another hat that they're supposed to be uh, wearing, then it can cause delays in scheduling um, necessary procedures. And then, of course, patients aren't happy and we lose our efficiencies. Whether or not somebody is monitoring the status of submitted claims and actually paying attention for groups that outsource this, there is a lot of faith that your third party billing company is really on top of this and you're getting uh, what you pay for. And But if you don't have the metrics to monitor your third party billing company, you don't know whether or not they're doing a great job for you. So constantly making sure you actually have a metrics list of what you define as success with your partnership with your external billing company. One thing I've noticed that actually happens with uh, great frequency is a certain discomfort or inconsistency in collecting co-pays and patient balances at each appointment, making sure that you have a script for your front desk people to ask, how much would you like to pay towards your balance today, rather than would you like to pay for your balance? Because the answer, if you ask somebody how much they would like to pay, maybe they pay $20, maybe it's $5, maybe it's the entire patient balance, but making sure that you are actually asking those questions rather than assuming it should just go through billing. If you collect things up front, it's going to have a huge impact on your cash flow. We were working with a hospital earlier this year in the Midwest that had nine different practices. Just by, st they did have a policy about collecting co-pays, um, but making sure it was enforced and standardizing it and instituting a script with regular audits just to make sure, and this can be done in a friendly way. I would be walking through the clinic and just tap somebody on the shoulder when I noticed they didn't ask for the copay or the patient balance and just kindly remind them that they need to be doing that and refer to the script that's right next to their computer. As a result, in less than six months, we actually improved cash collections across those nine practices by 51.1%. When you're talking about your financial viability as a practice, those are significant and meaningful numbers. So with that, I want to give you all a to-do list uh, from today of things to go back and check on your practices uh, and make sure that you're doing. Do you have your practice managers and working with them and the physicians inspect your contracts and make sure that they tie back with what you think and are being executed the way you think? Check what your physician spend is. Make sure you're tracking that and, and making sure it makes sense with what you are getting paid for and how you plan to get paid for in the future. Make sure you're scheduling templates. 
line up with that and um, are achieving what you want to with regards to patient access, review your payer contracts. If you haven't done so, remember these should be done on at least on an annual basis, quarterly for the very complex practice uh, payer contracts and that they're actually being executed the way you think they are. And monitor your revenue cycle process. I do recommend having a management dashboard that has these different financial ratios and staffing ratios associated that you are checking towards at least your own internal benchmark. Yes, there's national data. Yes, there's regional data. But really, I find it beneficial in making actual change and improving that loss per provider number is by saying, okay, here's where our baseline it is. What happens to this number if we inc if we pick five different categories and say we want to improve them 10% over the next 10, six months? And if you actually engage with your groups on that and how can we do that, you'll start seeing that move, move the needle and start beating the median. That being said, um, I went over some of these different pieces already. While this losses are status quo, do not accept them. They are not financially sustainable. Make sure you understand why are you having this loss. Sometimes some losses are acceptable, others are not. If you do not know the why, then you should not be in the mentality of accepting them. Make sure you monitor your the metrics that you are measuring and making sure that those metrics are constantly in line with what you are trying to achieve. You know, if you need help with any setting up any of these management tools, we're happy to do so. They don't take a ton of work to do, and even starting with simple metrics can make a huge difference. One thing I will end on this note is make sure you do have your physicians engaged, whether I like using a physician action council that gives the physician um, a feeling of empowerment over the practice and make them invested in the success of that practice, having them meet on a regular basis. And, and brainstorming as to what they can do to actually move that needle, rather than any time you tell the physician simply just work harder and it's a mandate from the higher up administration, I do not see progress in those types of situations. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jeff to address issues of productivity and labor. Thank you. Thank you, Opal. Um, and I think before we start on this section, I should say that, that the thrust of what we're talking about around staffing efficiency that I'll be talking about with you this afternoon is really hospital-centric. Clearly, as Opal outlined, there is a set of uh, efficiency and productivity uh, standards on the clinic side, but this is, this is hospital-centric in its narrative and in its examples. Um, some of the approaches certainly can be applied in the clinic setting. Um, what I would say is um, the environment we're in with declining reimbursement, um, volumes that are, are shifting away from um, legacy business, inpatient business into outpatient business with new competitors, all introduce a significant set of challenges. The operating model uh, of, of hospitals um, with significant um, fixed costs, um, the, the imperative is to try to convert uh, some component of that fixed labor cost into variable cost, a fluid workforce, if, if uh, wherever possible. Um, the cost structure of organizations, 50 to 60% of that operating expense is um, really based on labor costs and associated uh, benefits. And so uh, obviously, if you're looking at your cost structure, that's a really important place to, to look. The, the systems and tools and approaches that we'll describe today um, have been found um, to, to, when you match staffing with demand, to reduce labor expenses between 10 and 15 percent when they're applied and um, effectively um, coached and, and implemented. Um, hospitals and health systems of all sizes can benefit from this approach, uh, the caveat being that the smallest organizations, and I'm talking about, you know, the smallest uh, critical access hospitals, not all critical access hospitals, but the smallest critical access hospitals, um, have a, a higher degree of fixed staffing and uh, less scope and scale to improve upon. So that does become a, a rate limiter, if you will, at the, the far small end of the spectrum. Um, before we dive into this, I thought it might be useful to share a case study. Um, this was a, a community hospital that our organization uh, worked with uh, in the last 18 months. Um, 100 million net patient revenue, um, experiencing significant financial losses, had seen an erosion of volume 
um, that had, had stabilized somewhat, but they, they had not uh, adjusted staffing levels and did not have a set of tools uh, and processes in place to, to staff to volume. Um, we were engaged and within a 12 week period of time, Stroudwater did a rapid assessment um, uh, of, of key cost centers and departments. Um, we worked shoulder to shoulder with hospital leadership um, and um, frontline managers in those departments to implement tools um, and resources to better uh, match staffing with the, the fluctuations and actual uh, volumes. As a result of these steps, um, the hospital realized about 4.5 million of savings uh, within the first seven months of, of us uh, assisting them. Uh, importantly, um, we want these changes to be sustainable and durable. Uh, and so how those become sustainable is that the capacity of the organization to manage staffing um, to volume is, is enhanced. And so embedding tools uh, and coaching and training uh, frontline managers to use those tools and to access data and information um, to drive bottom line results is really uh, essential to that result. Um, wanted before we get too much further into the discussion i want to uh, do a polling question with you and the question is uh, do your frontline managers have the tools and processes to forward manage and staff their units based on anticipated volume so based upon trends weekly daily etc seasonally are do you have adequate tools to do that please select the one that most applies to your organization Jeff, are you trying to take my job? I apologize, Kimberly. <laughs> I get on a roll and sometimes it's hard to stop. Um, it looks like we're seeing some live results here now. About 33% are saying that they do have the tools, but they're still um, facing issues. Um, and I'll give people a few more seconds to opine and then we will show the results. Okay, coming up on the screen for you, Jeff. Great. Um, well, you can see there that there's about 90% of the organizations um, that either have issues with flexing, but have the tools, or don't have the tools, or are unsure. Slightly less than 10% are saying, you know, we've got what we need to, to uh, manage staffing um, to, to variable volume. Uh, so, so very helpful. Thank you for, for sharing those uh, insights with us. Um, and thank you, Kimberly. Um, so this slide really provides a, a nice schematic and overview of, of our approach. And I think the key takeaway um, that we would want to leave you with is that to implement um, the tools and systems and approaches and affect the training um, required um, is not a long drawn out process that that our team has developed a 12 week uh, approach to this with the first a couple of weeks being uh, data analysis and assessment coming on site and looking at um, uh, the situation on the ground um, where we're trying to do a rapid diagnosis of um, what some of the opportunities and the constraints are um, and then the middle portion the middle three weeks where we really get into um, customizing an approach a, for which departments uh, we, we want to um, um, most affect, um, and then secondly, what are the right uh, approaches and tools given circumstances on the ground and the needs and the opportunities. So we're, we're designing and um, introducing um, the, the tools, we're, we're gathering data, and we're monitoring usage of those, those tools uh, in the middle, middle three weeks. And the final half of the uh, engagement um, what we're really doing is focusing on training, tracking, and engaging frontline managers. Um, having that, that engagement with the frontline managers in the departments in which we're, we're implementing these tools um, is really critical. We want them to have ownership of the tools and the processes at the department level. Uh, and so the, the goal with, with this approach is to provide insight to key decision makers in the organization, importantly, those include the frontline managers and the departments affected, uh, and objectivity, create understanding uh, and buy-in um, to the process. Um, 
So we want to make sure that as a result of this process in the middle section, we've unmasked opportunities. And in the second half of the engagement, um, we are doing the training and uh, actual implementation so that those, those opportunities can be realized and realized in a sustainable way. Focusing in a little bit on the first couple of weeks uh, of the engagement, what we really want to do is track, translate actual historical data uh, into uh, insight and information that frontline managers can understand and, and react to uh, and drive change. Um, we want to understand the current state of labor management processes um, and, and um, identify and quantify the opportunities to, to change. A lot of this conversation is looking at 52 weeks worth of uh, staffing and productivity data within the organization and then creating a preliminary goal uh, or best practice, if you will, at the 25th percentile of performance. Uh, and so what we're doing is using the organization's own data and looking at internal best practice and saying that's a reasonable place for us to begin the conversation. Um, the basis for the, the, the measurement of performance is something that we call um, worked hours per unit of service. And the per unit of service is important because that, that is specific to each department or function within the hospital. Um, it could be nursing hours. It could be um, um, the number of, of images in a, in a given depart, uh, department, et cetera. But each unit of service is specific to that department. And then we looked at the worked hours that are done, and that's the basis of comparison. Um, so we want to focus on how maybe we can replicate that 25th percentile performance that we hit uh, a quarter of the time in the previous year, and what are some of the barriers and constraints to getting there. Um, in the middle section um, of our um, engagement, what we're focusing on, again, is that 25th percentile. We're empowering and equipping frontline managers with tools and metrics and those reporting um, um, uh, skills. Um, we are focusing really on measuring, monitoring, and management. And so if we have the right data and we have the right tools to capture data and report data, that's where we can start to see um, really a change in each department's productivity. Um, but it's around um, um, beginning to implement and monitor the workforce so that you can flex, the departments can flex, and respond to different um, changes in, in services. It's important that uh, at this point in time that the department managers really are engaged. They're the key um, uh, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And so the collaboration with those department managers and the ability to compare uh, performance and, and really empower them is essential um, to our process. As we look at the second half of the engagement, um, we've introduced the tools and the resources. We've identified preliminary best practices. That's that 25th percentile of performance. And we're utilizing data and the reporting tools to uh, drive uh, improvement. Um, the focus is on continuing the transition, reassuring managers, and coaching them. Um, we want to continue to identify and overcome barriers uh, and make sure that we have really robust communication in place. One of the mechanisms to do that is the third point there on this slide, which is empowering PI teams, performance improvement teams, with, again, processes, tools, and the authority to take action. So those PI teams are cross-functional, um, and they, they really are where continued improvement and monitoring of the demand-based staffing approach resides on a going-forward basis. It's a key convener of frontline managers um, going forward. Um, another example of um, a prior Stroudwater client, this is a um, 40 million net patient revenue hospital in the Northeast, um, and uh, they, they recognized they needed better labor and um, cost reporting and control tools. Um, Stroudwater did our initial assessment, um, and we uh, developed and deployed shift management tools, which really focus on shift by shift um, um, productivity and day by day productivity. So it's a very much of a kind of a real time tool and also a performance tracker 
Um, those tools were implemented across the, the departments and cost centers of focus. The performance tracker really focuses on pay period by pay period uh, performance. Um, with this, the hospital within six weeks, third pay period, was able to realize an 11% improvement in labor expenses. And this was largely driven by just simply greater awareness of the opportunity and some of the inefficiencies that were embedded in how they'd done business historically. Um, so it was just creating that awareness via shared information, transparent information, high quality information that drove, drove the results. Um, we've continued to work with this organization to train new managers so that, again, this is embedded and sustainable um, and add additional cost centers um, to this uh, approach within the organization. Um, so best practices for enhancing um, productivity, clearly um, one of the things we'd want you to take away with from this webinar is that the, the battle to change and become more variable in your staffing and more e efficient at the department level is won or lost with your frontline managers. This is not, cannot be seen as an edict from on high. Um, in, in the most effective cases, it's something that those frontline managers own and embrace and are empowered to uh, affect and continue to manage via the, the PI team and via um, the tools and, and processes that are put in place. Um, so that's, that's really essential. The communication um, that needs to exist is something that may be a, a new uh, approach for organizations and, and may not be how some organizations have run relative to the frontline managers and creating that em empowerment, but it is crucial to moving the organization forward and getting the full results in our experience. Um, lastly, I think the integrity of the information and the transparency of the information is essential. It's essential for um, folks to trust the process and, and to have the motivation uh, as a team to um, enact changes and um, um, impact behaviors and drive performance. So that focus, and I mentioned the shift management tool on as much real time and immediate time information is key. A lot of organizations have monthly uh, or quarterly reports that they look back at. Um, the problem is, is that the situation that you were staffing to has already come and gone and you need to focus on what's coming up. You need insight and actionable data. Uh, and that's really what the demand-based staffing approach that's been developed by our team um, does. Um, I want to pause there. We've got a few minutes for um, questions. And um, certainly, if, if anybody has a question on um, the, the content of today's webinar, please feel free to reach out to Opal or myself. Um, we'd be happy to have a discussion with you. Um, Kimberly, I don't know if you're manning the, the questions uh, or, or not at this point. I am womaning the questions, and I, I have one that I think would be best suited for Opal's expertise. Um, you mentioned uh, dashboards, Opal, and this attendee would like to know are there dashboards that are specific to um, furthering engagement with providers? Yes, um, that's a great question. There are vast, you want to have two different dashboards. You have your management dashboard that, that I showed. Here are the different metrics that you want to be able to monitor as a manager. But then you want to have dashboards with regards to how you engage with the physicians. The most important thing to have on those dashboards is actually anything that impacts physician compensation. So if you have work RVUs that the incentive that you're paying the physician off of an incentive compensation tied to work RVU productivity, you want to have on that dashboard the work RVUs that the physician has performed um, for in, during that pay period. So whether it's the trailing 12 months, if you do things quarterly, whatever your reconciliation date is in your contract. So you need to have that on the dashboard, what their threshold is for being able to hit productivity, where they are compared to other members within that same specialty within their group, and then potentially like an MGMA or an AMGA or Sullivan Cotter type um, metric as well that's included in there. On top of that, I would actually show a work RVU breakout between where their work RVU is generated, whether it's um, surgery, EM codes, radiology, et cetera, based off of what that breakout and so that they can see how that is trending. 
So anything that the physicians compensate for, that includes if it's also hours associated with administrative duties, if it's quality metrics, how are they performing compared to quality. And then I always include in that dashboard also the financial information with regards to that practice because I want to engage with my physicians about that financial performance. If they see losses, if they see different trend lines, most physicians I work with want to engage and have a conversation about that because then they're, con they're seeing the numbers and they're seeing how their actions can impact those numbers. And you can actually have a well-engaged uh, medical staff when you do that types of things with regards to your dashboards. I'll say one other thing with regard to the dashboards. Have those dashboard conversations with the physician in person. Shooting out an email, we all know not everybody opens every email, but it takes for granted that people are understanding things the way you want them to understand them and the way that you mean them. So, um, but great question. Thank you, Opal. Um, we have a couple minutes left um, for another question. And uh, Jeff, I think this would be for you on demand-based staffing. Um, can you give uh, folks an idea of what those shift management tools look like once they're deployed with the frontline managers in the hospital? Um, sure, Kimberly. The, the, I think as I, I manage, the, the shift management tool really is a shift by shift, day by day, depending upon the, uh, the department. Uh, so, for instance, nursing units would be very much a shift by shift. Some other departments might be day by day. Um, set of inputs um, and, and uh, uh, resulting analysis and metrics. Um, and it really is meant to be kind of that real-time, hands-on, um, tool that can be used by the, the department manager, again, to, to manage worked hours per unit of service in whichever department we're talking about. Um, the, the other tool that I mentioned, uh, which is called the performance tracker, really is kind of one step removed uh, back at the pay period level and really allows for, uh, again, not, not so much the hands-on uh, management of real-time data, but, but ability to step back a little bit and look at which, which departments or cost centers are performing um, relative to the, to the goal. If the goal has been set and validated at a 25th percentile, um, you know, they, all of those can then be tracked um, based upon that. And that comparison data and performance data is really helpful to understand which departments are having more of a struggle uh, than others and allows folks to focus on uh, making sure that that uh, a department gets the additional attention or help or resources it needs to to try to manage within um, the staffing target, or if there's some confounding factor or barrier that that barrier is addressed. One thing I might suggest is I know um, we've done a, a number of us here um, our articles on I think both the shift management tool and the performance tracker that um, we can we can circulate to to attendees. Um, I think they're a, they, they've been out for, for a while now, but I think are still relevant to the question. So those might help folks better envision what those are. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Opal. Um, with that, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us on behalf of Jeff and Opal and all my colleagues at Stroudwater. Um, again, I will be sending out the desk presentation for this webinar, as well as the audio within the next 24 hours. Thank you so much for attending and have a lovely day.